In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the procedures by which we can form bigger groups out of smaller groups. There are two main methods by which this can be done. One of them is rather simple and straightforward. It is called the direct product of two groups. And the other one is slightly more involved. It's called the semi-direct product. As will be clear from the examples that we will show on the way, both of these kinds of products of groups have immense applications in physics. And that is not the only reason why we are going to study them. Many of the properties of large groups can be understood much more easily if you can think in terms of smaller groups, which in a sense build them up. So this notion of direct product and semi-direct product of groups will tell us how to sort of think about large groups in simpler terms. And what is perhaps more relevant for us in physical applications, when we talk of representations of direct and indirect products of groups, you will find that it is easy to figure out their behavior from the fact that we already understand the representations of the smaller groups, which are of course easier to understand. We have not talked about representation theory yet, but that's going to be our very next topic in this course. In fact, that is going to be the most important mathematical part of this course. And there you will see direct products of groups and semi-direct products of groups play a very big role. Let us start with the simpler of the two notions, that of the direct product. Now, when we describe a group, what we have to do is describe both the set underlying the group and the operation which describes multiplication in that group. So given two groups G1 and G2, let us now describe the direct product of the two groups written G1 O times G2 by this notation, by first describing the underlying set and then talking about the operation which is carried out in this direct product group. The underlying set is really very simple. It's just the Cartesian product of the two underlying sets G1 and G2. Remember, as always, we deliberately confuse the set and the group by calling them one and the same thing. Let me remind you of elementary set theory here. G1 cross G2, of course, is a set whose elements are the, just tuples. Pairs of elements in which the first element small g1 comes from the set capital G1 and the second element small g2 comes from the set capital G2. So this is the underlying set, just pairs of elements, one each from each group. And then we come to the product law, the multiplication law for the direct product group. And that is simplicity itself. If you are taking two such elements of G1 O times G2, that is one pair G1 comma G2 and another pair G1 prime comma G2 prime, where of course G1 and G1 prime come from the group G capital G1 and G2 and G2 prime come from the group capital G2. The product of these two pairs is defined simply by this result, G1 times G1 prime comma G2 times G2 prime. What this essentially means is that in a direct product group, each individual component group does its own thing. That is, you really just combine the first group's element with the first group's elements and the second group's elements with the second group's elements using their respective multiplication law. Note that this is an overall multiplication rule and the way in which you build it up is you use the individual multiplication rules in the two groups. The G1, G1 prime product is being carried out using the multiplication rule of the first group. The G2, G2 prime product is being carried out using the multiplication rule of the second group. Of course, what we really should do at this stage is verify that what we have is really a group. That is, the underlying set that we have described, the set of tuples with two elements, one from G1 and the other from G2, with this particular multiplication rule, does satisfy all the basic properties that a group must have. Now, this is really very, very trivial to show, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. It is very easy to verify that this really is a group. Now, what is very important and also rather obvious is that this particular group, the so-called direct product group, 
has an identity element which is made out of the identity elements of the individual pieces. There is a tuple made with E1 and E2, the identities of the groups G1 and G2 together is the identity for the direct product group. The other important result which is also very easy to verify is that for any arbitrary element of the direct product group G1, G2, the inverse is simply G1 inverse comma G2 inverse. As I said, each group does its own thing. The identity in the direct product is the identity of the individual groups. The inverse in the direct product is also the inverse according to the individual groups multiplication laws. So before we look any further into the properties of the direct product of two groups, let me just motivate the reason behind being interested in them, at least from physics. Now, if you have a composite system in physics, that is a system which is made out of different parts, it's possible that each individual part will be symmetric under certain different symmetry groups. And then the whole system will be symmetric under the direct product of these groups because each piece of the direct product will act on each individual system leading to that part of the system staying the same. And of course, if both parts of a system stays the same, then the overall system stays the same. So this is how you often encounter uh, direct product groups in the quest of symmetries for physical systems. One such very important example is also one which almost everybody has heard of. It is a famous example of the SU3 direct product with SU2 direct product with U1 symmetry group, which is a symmetry group for the standard model of elementary particle physics. By the time this course ends, I hope to at least give you a basic understanding of what this symmetry group means in terms of the standard model. Now that I have hopefully given you enough reason to study direct product of groups, apart from the purely mathematical reason that they are going to be very useful in the mathematical structure of representation theory, let us now return to the question of the mathematical properties of the direct product of two groups. In particular, let us see how our original groups G1 and G2 sort of fit in into the direct product. So, as it should be sort of obvious, G1 should be somewhere inside my G1 O times G2, so should be G2. To make it more precise, let us consider this particular subset G1 tilde of G1 O times G2, where the pairs in G1 tilde are formed by taking an element G1 from the group capital G1. This is an entirely arbitrary element. But by fixing the second element to be E2, the identity of this group G2. Now, it's very easy to see that if you were to multiply two such elements, G1 E2 with G1 prime E2, where G1 and G1 prime are of course elements of the group capital G1, then according to our rule for multiplication of direct product elements, it's simply going to be G1, G1 prime, comma, E2. In other words, the set G1 tilde is closed under this multiplication rule. It's actually pretty easy to verify that G1 tilde is actually a subgroup of G1 O times G2. And it's rather trivial, but it needs to be said that G1 tilde is actually isomorphic to G1. So we often say that G1 is a subgroup of G1 O times G2. Of course, what we should really be saying is G1 is isomorphic to a group G1 tilde, which is a subgroup of G1 O times G2. But as I have said several times before, we usually do not distinguish between isomorphic groups when we are talking about group structure. So we will definitely keep on saying that G1 is a subgroup of G1 O times G2. Actually, it turns out that it's more than just a subgroup. It is a normal subgroup. To check with that, what we do is we take an arbitrary element G1 bar G2 bar from G1 O times G2 and conjugate G1 tilde using G1 bar G2 bar. So we take an arbitrary element in G1 tilde which is G1 comma E2 and apply the conjugation operation via G1 bar G2 bar on it. So G1 bar G2 bar, G1 E2, 
G1 bar G2 bar inverse is what we want to determine now. And of course, what we already know that G1 bar G2 bar's inverse is G1 bar inverse G2 bar inverse. And just by using the standard rule for the multiplication in the direct product, what we will end up with is that this expression is actually G1 bar G1 G1 bar inverse. There's the first components doing their own thing. And G2 bar E2 G2 bar inverse in the second place. But notice that G2 bar E2 G2 bar inverse, of course, is nothing but E2. And hence, this quantity for an arbitrary element from G1 tilde, the conjugation by G1 bar G2 bar is also an element in G1 tilde. What that means is for all G1 bar G2 bar in the direct product or product group, uh, the conjugation of the group G1 tilde by G1 bar G2 bar is a subset of G1 tilde. That is, every element in here is also in here. However, that's all that we really need to show that this is actually equal to G1 tilde, as we have explained several times before. So this actually goes to show that G1 tilde is a normal subgroup of G1 O times G2. Of course, once again, we don't usually use the word G1 tilde here. We just say G1 is a normal subgroup of G1 O times G2. Well, there's nothing special about G1. Exactly the same argument can be made about G2. So the final upshot of this is the subgroups G1, E2, where G1 runs over capital G1, this is our G1 tilde, and the G2 tilde, which is E1, G2, where G2 runs over the entire capital G2, these are actually isomorphic to G1 and G2, respectively, and these are normal subgroups of G1 O times G2. Of course, if these are normal subgroups, then you can form quotient groups with them. And it is very easy to show the result that I am going to flash on the screen right now. I am not going to prove this, but the proof is very, very simple to come up with. Please try it yourself. Much more importantly, the notation sort of makes it obvious. Notice that the result that we are talking about is the quotient group G1 O times G2 quotiented with G1 is actually isomorphic to G2 and G1 O times G2 quotiented by G2 is isomorphic to G1. So when two groups combine together by the direct product process to form a bigger group, they end up being normal subgroups of that bigger group. And when you quotient the bigger group by one of the factors, you get the other one. So this sort of makes the multiplication and division notation that we use here sort of consistent with what we usually mean by multiplication or division. Of course, what we are doing here is much more complicated than ordinary multiplication or division. These are operations on whole groups. However, the notation sort of fits everything together very nicely. Let me point out two other very important features of these subgroups G1 tilde and G2 tilde, which are of course isomorphic to G1 and G2, as we have been saying. Their intersection, that is a collection of the common elements, is really very simple. There is only one element in the intersection, which happens to be E1, E2. So this is a singleton set with just the identity of the G1 O times G2 group. Now, you must recall that the intersection of any two subgroups of a group happens to be a subgroup. And this is the smallest possible subgroup which G1 O times G2 has, namely just the identity of the direct product group. Another important point is that any element G1, G2 of G1 O times G2 can be written down as a product of an element G1, E2 from G1 tilde and E1, G2 from G2 tilde. So basically, you can write G1 O times G2 as G1 tilde times G2 tilde, this being the product of sets, as we had defined before. It turns out that these observations come in very handy when we ask the converse question. Here we have taken two groups G1 and G2 and formed their direct product. However, we can also ask the question, given a group G, can we write that as a direct product of two of its subgroups? 
You must realize that this question is of immense importance simply because if you can do that, you can study the properties of the bigger group simply by studying the properties of the smaller groups individually. And life would be very, very easy in that case. So when can we actually tell whether a group is a direct product of two of its subgroups? And the answer to that is very similar to what we have already seen. For this to happen, you need two subgroups N1 and N2, which are normal subgroups of G, with these features. That N1 intersection N2 is the smallest possible subgroup which G has, namely the subgroup with only the identity in it. And G is N1 times N2 as a product of sets. That is, if you multiply an element from N1 by an element of N2 and form all such products, you get G back. If this happens, then G is actually isomorphic to the direct product of N1 and N2. Now let us try proving this. The first ingredient in the proof starts with the statement that G is N1 N2. What that means, of course, is that for all small g, which belongs to capital G, there is an element small n1 in capital N1 and another element small n2 in capital N2 such that G is N1, N2. What is very, very important is that this result, that N1 intersection N2 is just the identity, implies that this decomposition of G into N1, N2 is unique. In other words, if G were both N1, N2 and N1 prime, N2 prime, with N1, N1 prime coming from capital N1 and N2, N2 prime coming from capital N2, then, of course, you can rewrite this to say n1 prime inverse n1 is equal to n2 prime n2 inverse. Thus, simply by left multiplying by the inverse of n1 prime and right multiplying by the inverse of n2. Now, notice that the left hand side here, n1 prime inverse n1, belongs to capital N1, whereas the right hand side, n2 prime n2 inverse, belongs to capital N2. So this is an element which is both in capital N1 and capital N2 and since the intersection of N1 and N2 is just the identity and identity alone, it has to be the same as E, which immediately tells you that N1 prime has to be the same as N1 and N2 prime has to be the same as N2. Thus, this decomposition of G into the product N1, N2 is a unique decomposition there is only one element in capital N1 and only one element in capital N2 whose product will give you a given element small g from the group capital G. Let me also point out at this stage is that for this to be true, you did not really require the subgroups N1 and N2 to be normal subgroups. If you had any two subgroups whose product was the group G, which would imply G would be h1, h2, where small h1 would come from capital H1 and small h2 would come from capital H2. And if these subgroups capital H1 and capital H2 had the identity alone as the intersection, even then this result would follow. The importance of the uniqueness of this decomposition is that this allows us to define a map from the group capital G to the group N1 O times N2. Remember the elements of N1 O times N2 are pairs of elements, one from N1, the other from N2. And here, the map, which we can immediately define as small g maps to the pair N1, N2 is a well-defined map. Because given a small g, there is only one N1 and one N2 belonging to capital N1 and capital N2 respectively, such that g will be N1 times N2. So this map from capital G to N1 O times N2 is well defined. What we want to show is that this map is actually an isomorphism. So what we need to show is that it is a bijection. Now this part is very, very trivial. It's almost obvious from the definition. So I will leave you to fill in the blanks here. What we really need to show, that non-trivial part, is that this is a homomorphism. That is, it preserves 
group structure. To prove that this map is a homomorphism, we need to make use of a very important result, which is that under the condition stated above, the elements of the subgroup N1 and the elements of the subgroup N2 commute. To figure that out, what we need to do to take arbitrary elements small n1 and small n2 from the two subgroups and then form the commutator n1 n2 n1 inverse n2 inverse. Now my claim is that this is the identity. How do we prove that? Well, the proof really goes by using the associative law creatively. If you take the first three terms in the product on the left together, that is n1 n2 n1 inverse, then because capital N2 is a normal subgroup, you will conclude that N1 small n2 n1 inverse has to be in capital N2. And hence, that times N2 inverse has to be in capital N2. On the other hand, if you take the last three terms together, then you get N2, N1 inverse, N2 inverse. Remember, N1 inverse is an element in capital N1. So N2 times an element in capital N1 times N2 inverse has to be in capital N1 because capital N1 is a normal subgroup. So this is the part where capital N1 and capital N2 both being normal subgroups of G comes in handy. So what we have concluded is the last three terms multiplied together is an element in capital N1. So the overall product which is small n1 times that has to be in capital N1. So what we have concluded is that this element is in both capital N1 and capital N2. So it is in the intersection which has only one element as we have assumed. So this element has to be the identity. And this immediately leads to the conclusion that N1, N2 is equal to N2, N1. After all, that's exactly what the commutator N1, N2, N1 inverse, N2 inverse is good for. If it is the identity, the two elements have to commute. The way in which we use this is the following. We take two elements G and G prime of capital G. Now G will map to N1, N2 where, where G is equal to N1, N2. And G prime will map onto N1 prime, N2 prime. And G prime is N1 prime, N2 prime. Now what does G, G prime map to? Since G is N1, N2 and G prime is N1 prime, N2 prime, G, G prime is of course N1, N2 times N1 prime, N2 prime. But now we make use of the fact that all elements of capital N1 commute with all elements of capital N2, which means I can swap the N2 and N1 prime here and write this as N1, N1 prime, N2, N2 prime. Now, this of course is where we have written GG prime, the element of capital G, as a product of two elements, N1, N1 prime from capital N1, and N2, N2 prime from capital N2. So our map will take this to the pair N1, N1 prime, comma N2, N2 prime. But we know, according to the rule of multiplication in the direct product set, this is exactly the product of N1, comma N2 and N1 prime, comma N2 prime. So what GG prime maps to is the result of the product of what G maps to and what G prime maps to individually. Hence, this map is a homomorphism. Since we have already established that this is a bijection, this map is actually an isomorphism. So we have managed to prove our contention that if a group G has two normal subgroups, N1 and N2, whose intersection is just the identity and the identity alone, and which are such that every element of G is a product of an element of N1 and an element of N2, then G is isomorphic to the direct product of N1 and N2. And this is how you know whether a group can be split into smaller factors which together form the group G by doing a direct product. This will come in very, very handy when we try to take a look at complex big groups in the future. Now, the direct product is very simple as a mathematical structure. As you have seen, just the case of two groups, each acting in its own way. However, there are many important instances 
when a big group is made out of two small groups in which the two groups don't really work completely independently of each other somehow one gets mixed up with the other and this is what gives rise to a semi direct product now this semi direct product is a slightly more complicated notion so it's best that we look at an example before we dive into the theory of a semi direct product and the example i've chosen for you is a very very important example in physics in fact one look at that should tell you why the semi direct product is so important a notion as far as group theoretical applications to physics is concerned the physically motivated group that i have in mind is a group which describes the symmetry of all physical laws as you know all theories of physics are symmetric under lorentz transformations and translations lorentz transformations are transformations which change your coordinates four coordinates x0 x1 x2 x3 to x prime 0 x prime 1 x prime 2 x prime 3 in a linear manner in such a way that the interval is invariant that is eta mu nu x prime mu x prime nu summed over all mu and nu is the same as eta rho sigma x rho x sigma and if you use that this immediately tells you that the coefficients of the linear transformation here written lambda upper mu lower nu obey this particular relationship eta mu nu lambda mu rho lambda nu sigma is eta rho sigma so these transformations are called lorentz transformations translations on the other hand are very very simple x mu changes to x prime mu which is x mu plus a mu a0 a1 a2 a3 being four components of a constant four vector now the poincare group is a group which describes the combination of these two operations that is you do a transformation which is labeled by two elements lambda which is the lorentz transformation matrix and a the four vector des describing the translation and what this does is that it actually changes x mu to x prime mu by this law here what this law is telling you is that you first do a lorentz transformation by the components of lambda to give you lambda mu nu x nu and then you translate the resulting four vector by the constant four vector a mu so poincare transformation lambda comma a really is a lorentz transformation lambda followed by a translation a we will often use a shorthand notation that x maps to x prime equal to lambda x plus a without writing the indices explicitly of course you can think of this as a 4 by 4 matrix lambda acting on a 4 by 1 column vector x added to a constant 4 by 1 column vector a to produce a new 4 by 1 column vector x prime now as we have been mentioning the set of all lorentz transformations curly l form a group the so called lorentz group this is something which you can easily check from the definition so do the set curly t of all the translations and in a sense the poincare group in which you do lorentz transformations and translations is really a product of these two groups but this product is written within quotes because this is not a direct product as you will soon see you can easily figure out the composition rule for two poincare transformations by just applying one poincare transformation after another so if you apply the poincare transformation lambda 1 a1 on x the result is a four vector x prime which is of course lambda 1 x plus a1 now let us apply lambda 2 a2 another poincare transformation on x prime that is i am applying lambda 2 a2 after i apply lambda 1 a1 on x so what is lambda 2 a2 going to do it's going to change x prime to x double prime which is lambda 2 x prime plus a2 but as a result what you are going to get is x double prime which is lambda 2 times x prime which is lambda 1 x plus a1 plus a2 and this is lambda 2 lambda 1 acting on x plus lambda 2 a1 plus a2 note that this is the part of the transformation which depends on the original four vector x and you can easily check that the product of two lorentz transformations which is sitting here is a lorentz transformation 
Of course, the set of all Lorentz transformations is a group, as I have mentioned before. In addition to that, you have a piece which is a constant, that is, which is independent of the x it's acting upon. So, this is a translation. So, the result of applying two successive transformations, lambda 2 a2 times lambda 1 a1. Remember, when you say lambda 2 a2 times lambda 1 a1, it is lambda 1 a1 which acts first, then lambda 2 a2 acts on the result. And the combination that you have seen here is a Lorentz transformation lambda to lambda 1 and a translation lambda to a1 plus a2. So notice that the transformation rule here is not just the Lorentz transformations do their own thing, which in fact they do here. Lambda 2 and lambda 1 do combine to give you lambda 2, lambda 1. But pure translations would have meant a2 and a1 combined to give you a2 plus a1. Here on the other hand, a2 and a1 combine by adding a2 to not a1 but lambda to a1. Somehow the Lorentz transformation which is here is acting on the a1 to produce a new 4 vector and then that's getting added to a2. So what you have here is that two groups do act almost on their own. In the one of the two groups actually acts on its own. But when the other group's composition rule is applied, it's not the elements which directly combine, but one of the elements get acted upon by the other group and then the two combine. Of course, for this to happen, it should be possible for one of the groups to act on the elements of the other group. And this is a sort of generic template which defines semi-direct product for us. We are next going to take a look at a proper mathematical definition of semi-direct products in general and try to see how this thing fits into that picture. Let us now formally define the semi-direct product of two groups. As you may have guessed, the definition itself is actually a bit more complicated than the simple definition that we had for direct products. Here, what we need are two groups, capital G and another group, curly G, but curly G cannot be any other group. Curly G must be a group which is isomorphic to a subgroup of the automorphism group for G. Now, this may sound very complicated, but all you are really saying is that elements of curly G should somehow be able to act on capital G elements to produce new capital G elements. That, remember, is not a surprise given the fact that we have already seen that Lorentz transformations act on translations to produce new translations. Now, given two groups, capital G and curly G, like this, you can define their semi-direct product, G, semi-direct product of curly G, with this special symbol which is used for the semi-direct product. And the underlying set is defined to be simply the Cartesian product of the two, which means, once again, an element of the semi-direct product group is a pair. The first element comes from capital G, the second element comes from curly G. Now, the combination law that you have here, this is what distinguishes a semi-direct product from a direct product. If you multiply two elements g, comma alpha and g prime, comma alpha prime, according to this particular rule, what you end up is alpha and alpha prime combined among themselves. So, the elements of curly G do their own thing as they did for the direct product case. However, when you are talking of combining the elements G and G prime, they don't combine directly. Alpha gets to act on G prime. Remember, alpha is a member of curly G, which is isomorphic to a subgroup of OT capital G. It makes sense to say alpha is acting on G prime, because alpha, after all, is essentially an element of the automorphism group of capital G. So alpha acting on G prime gives you alpha G prime, and that's what combines with G to give you the product. Just to make the parallel with the Poincaré group more clear, there the group capital G was actually the group of translations, and the group curly G was actually the Lorentz group. So we wrote those elements there in the other order. We wrote lambda first, A next. But in general, when we talk about elements of a semi-direct product, we usually write the elements of the group that is acted upon first, 
and the group that acts on it after that. As in the case of the direct product of two groups, it is rather easy to show that this rule actually defines a group. It takes a bit more work in this case than for the direct product, but it's really rather simple. And it's also pretty easy to see that the identity element for this group is basically the identity of capital G and the identity of curly G put in a pair. Now, what we are going to do in what follows is that we are going to write the identity of capital G as E, just the standard notation for the identity of a group. But for the identity of curly G, what we are going to do is write ID. The ID, of course, stands for the identity operation. Remember, uh, curly G essentially gives you automorphisms on capital G. So basically what we are trying to imply is that the identity of curly G is really nothing but the identity automorphism acting on capital G. Now, we can also draw several other parallels between the direct product and the semi-direct product. And as we will see, there are lots of similarities, but there are some differences as well. Now, the first similarity that we can point out is just like G1 and G2 had isomorphic companions, tilde G1 and tilde G2, which were subgroups of the direct product G1 O times G2. Here, we have similar subgroups of the semi-direct product G with curly G. And for example, we have tilde G capital G, which is a group formed by the underlying set where the pairs are taken with small g running all over the group capital G, but the second element of the pair is the identity of curly G. That is the identity automorphism on capital G. Now, it's almost trivial to show that this is a subgroup. In fact, it's actually obvious that this is a subgroup which is isomorphic to G. And just like in the case of the direct product, this subgroup happens to be a normal subgroup of the semi-direct product of G and curly G. Now, the fact that this is a normal subgroup takes a bit more work to show than in the case of the direct product, but it's still rather easy to do. Well, very similarly, you also have a curly tilde G. That is, the set of all elements, all pairs, which are elements of the semi-direct product, where the first element in the pair is the identity of the group capital G, and the second element runs over the entire curly G group. And as is obvious, this is actually isomorphic to curly G itself. But here, the similarity with the direct product group actually ceases. This tilde curly G is a subgroup of the semi-direct product, but it's only a subgroup. It's not a normal subgroup. But there are other similarities here. For example, the intersection of these two subgroups of the semi-direct product is obviously a singleton set with the element E, comma, ID, which of course is the identity of the semi-direct product set. Also, if you were to multiply any two such elements, G, comma, ID from tilde G and E, comma, alpha from G, curly G tilde, what you are going to get is this. This is the standard rule by which you are going to multiply two elements in a semi-direct product. The automorphisms just compose among themselves, so you get ID times alpha. Whereas the group elements don't directly compose among themselves, G gets composed not with E directly, but with ID, the automorphism acting on E. This is of course a standard rule for handling products in the semi-direct product group. But remember, ID is an the identity automorphism. So what does it do to E? It moves E to E. So what you have on the first element here is G times E, which is of course G. And I times alpha is of course alpha itself. What this shows is that any element of the semi-direct product, an arbitrary element of the form G from capital G and alpha from curly G, can be written as a product of an element from tilde G and an element from 
till the curly G. So, as a set, the semi-direct product is actually a set product of tilde G and tilde curly G. This is a result, of course, which actually was there also for the direct product case. And just like in the direct product case, if you try forming the quotient group of the semi-direct product quotiented out by the normal subgroup capital G. Of course, there's a normal subgroup tilde G, but as, a, as we have said, we don't really distinguish between tilde G and its isomorphic companion G itself. What you get is actually curly G. So the automorphism group is actually what you get when you quotient out capital G itself, the group that is acted upon, from the semi-direct product. Note that you cannot really form a quotient group of G semi-direct product curly G with curly G because curly G is not a normal subgroup. So there again you see a difference. But there are, as you can see, quite a lot of parallels. But there are some differences as well. To make these notions clearer, let us take a look again at the one concrete example of the semi-direct product of two groups that we have already described. The Poincaré group. Well, in the Poincaré group, the translations form a normal subgroup. And as you can see, the Lorentz transformations act as automorphisms which act on the translations to produce new translations. So, the Poincaré group is really the semi-direct product of the translation group with the Lorentz group. And the Lorentz group, the group of automorphisms, is a subgroup of the Poincaré group, whereas the translation group, the group which is acted upon, is actually a normal subgroup. Now, the fact that the translation group is a normal subgroup is something which you can easily show just by referring to the composition law for the Poincaré group element. And, as we said, if you quotient out from the Poincaré group, the translation group, what you get is a Lorentz group. Let me remind you that a rather loose way of understanding the quotient group is as follows. In the quotient group G by N, the elements, of course, are the cosets with respect to N. And all elements of a given coset, essentially, are those which differ from each other only in elements of N, but are otherwise the same. So, basically, if you treat all N elements on the same footing, you get a coset. That's the rough understanding that I want you to uh, sort of bear in mind because very often in physical applications, this is going to help you identify this kind of structure very easily. So, here, all translations, if you consider them to be one and the same, then two different cosets differ simply because they are effectively different Lorentz transformations. So, it's not really a surprise that if you quotient out the translation group from the Poincaré group, you essentially Say that Poincaré ele group elements which differ by only a translation are not to be considered different elements. They're all going to be lumped together in one element. What you land up with is nothing but the Lorentz group, which is all that you are left with if you don't consider translations to be of any consequence. We will end by answering the same question that we raised for the direct product. Given a group capital G, can we tell whether it is a semi-direct product of two of its subgroups. Let me point out that we have already seen that the two groups, capital G and curly G, which make up the semi-direct product G, semi-direct product curly G, essentially are isomorphic to two subgroups which the semi-direct product has. One of them is a normal subgroup, the other one is not, but their setwise product actually gives you the semi-direct product itself. And their intersection is trivial, just the identity alone. As for the direct product case, for the semi-direct product 2, you essentially have the same ingredients in the theorem which tells you how to identify which subgroups can be taken a semi-direct product of to get a big group. But as you could very well expect, this is slightly more complicated than in the direct product case. So let's first start with a statement. In the statement, what we are asking really is when is a group G a semi-direct product of two of its subgroups? 
And this will happen according to this theorem. If you can find the normal subgroup N of G, and in addition, you can find another subgroup H of G with one very important condition. ZH, the center of the subgroup H, is just trivial subgroup, just the identity and nothing else. So H is not a normal subgroup, it's just a subgroup, but with this additional condition that the, that the center of H is just trivial. Now, in addition to this, you need two further conditions. The intersection of N and H is the trivial subgroup and G is the set product N times H. If all this is valid, then G is actually isomorphic to the semi-direct product of N with H. Actually, G is isomorphic with the semi-direct product of N and curly I of H, which is the group of inner automorphisms of H. But let me remind you of a corollary to the isomorphism theorems that we had talked about in the last lecture. For any group, if you quotient out the center of the group from that group, what you end up with is a quotient group which is isomorphic to curly I of that group, that is to the group of all inner automorphisms of that group. Now, because the center of H is taken to be trivial, in this case, what you have is curly I of H is actually isomorphic to H itself. So, you can write G as a semi-direct product of N and H. So, because this is a slightly more complicated theorem, let me point out how this differs with the case for the direct product and how it is similar. Well, the similarity is rather straightforward. You have two subgroups, N and H here. You had two normal subgroups, N1 and N2, in the direct, direct product case. There you had insisted that the intersection of N1 and N2 be trivial, that is just the identity, and G be N1 times N2 as a set. Here, you have something very similar. But instead of de demanding two normal subgroups, you are demanding one normal subgroup, N, and the other subgroup is no longer a normal subgroup, but it has this additional condition that ZH, the center of H, is actually isomorphic to the identity. Let us now quickly go through with a proof of this theorem. As you may have expected already, this proof has many parallels with a similar proof that we did for the direct product case. So, I'm not really going to spell out all the details here. You should be able to fill in the blanks pretty easily. Now, what we need to do, of course, is show that there is an isomorphism between G and N semi-direct product curly I of H. And in order to do that, what we need is first to construct a map phi which maps G to the semi-direct product. And the way we do this, is very similar to what we did in the previous case for the direct product. Because capital G is N times H as a set, and N intersection H is the identity alone, any element small g of capital G can be uniquely decomposed into product of a pair of elements, one from capital N, another from capital H. And given this unique decomposition, you can always map small g into an element of this semi-direct product, which is a pair of elements. The first element is taken from capital N itself, just the element N, whereas the second element is the particular inner automorphism of curly I of H, which is actually the inner automorphism induced by small h. Remember, the inner automorphism induced by small h essentially acts on a group element by conjugating it by small h. So, so g in the group will map onto h, g, h inverse under this. What we need to show is that this map phi is an isomorphism. As I've already noted, this is a well-defined map and that this is a bijection is pretty easy to prove. Again, I'm asking you to fill in the blanks here. What we need to show is that this map actually preserves group structure. Here, of course, by group structure, I mean the multiplication structure in the semi-direct product. So, we start with two elements from G. 
one is n h another g prime is n prime h prime so of course g g prime is n h times n prime h prime now unlike in the case of the direct product theorem where the two subgroups involved were normal subgroups and because the intersection was only the identity we managed to show that every element of n1 commuted with an element of n2 here that is no longer true the elements of capital n do not necessarily commute with the elements of capital h so that step of making the n prime jump across h and sitting next to n is not allowed here however what we can easily do is this what we can do is insert the identity h inverse h between n prime and h prime here of course all we are doing is inserting an identity which changes nothing but now we could use associativity to notice that this is the same as n times h n prime h inverse times h h prime and h n prime h inverse is nothing but the curly i h acting on n prime this is the conjugacy induced on n prime by small h now now note that g g prime has now again been written as a product of two elements the first element is from the normal subgroup because n is an element of the normal subgroup curly i h n prime h n prime h inverse because capital n is a normal subgroup has to be in capital n itself so these two elements are elements of the normal subgroup so the product is also an element in the normal subgroup h h prime of course is an element of the subgroup capital h now that we have written g g prime as a product of an element from capital n namely small n curly i h n prime and an element from capital h namely h h prime it is easy to figure out what phi maps this to in fact phi maps this to n curly i h n prime just the element from capital n times the inner automorphism induced by h h prime curly i h h prime let me just remind you that curly i h h prime is easily seen to be curly i h times curly i h prime and using that it is very easy to see that this thing which is phi of g g prime is nothing but phi g times phi g prime where of course the product here is a product according to the rule for forming the semi direct product of n and curly i of h so what we have managed to show is that this phi is a bijection between capital g and n semi direct product with curly i of h which is also a homomorphism so that map phi is an isomorphism and so capital g is actually isomorphic to this semi direct product in turn we already know that curly i of h is isomorphic to h so g turns out to be isomorphic to n semi direct product with h at this point we have gathered enough abstract group theory for us to go ahead with the next part of our course where we make things a bit more concrete we are not in a position to start talking directly about physical applications of group theory yet for that what we need to do is get another item into our toolkit which is a concrete version of the abstract group theory that we have been doing so far and that is the theory of group representations that is in a sense also abstract group theory however it is going to be much more concrete for us than just abstract theory of symbols being moved around on a piece of paper because most of the representations will have direct physical connotation for us so from the next lecture we will start describing group representation theory until then goodbye